are ready to begin. I'm Margaret Miller, the director of the Institute for Research and Art, which is the Contemporary Art Museum and Graphic Studio. And it's wonderful to see you all here tonight for our third faculty focus event. Um, the three artists in this exhibition are, coincidentally, artists working in the uh, gallery world and exhibiting their work all over. Uh, but they're also faculty members here at the University of South Florida. So I'm really delighted to offer the show to our students, our <coughs> university community, and the community beyond. The, uh, David Knorr, curator of exhibitions and special projects for the Institute, will be our moderator tonight. And in the course of his questions, he will introduce you in greater depth to the background of our artists. But may I introduce you to Neil Bender, who is uh, an assistant professor of painting and sculpture in the drawing. School uh, of Painting and Drawing. You have to understand I'm completely off my game today. I get the sculpture rather than great. And uh, painting and drawing in the School of Art and Art History. And next to him is Cesar Carneo, who is our newest faculty member, and he he's also assistant professor in the area of foundations. Finally, is Elizabeth Condon, not finally, but, but lastly, um, is the uh, assistant professor also of painting and drawing, Elizabeth Condon. So I'll turn it over to you and look forward to your remarks. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you all for coming on uh, such a cold and rainy night as it is. And I also understand we're, we're competing with another lecture uh, with Bill Irwin, so I'm glad that you're all here. There's, look, Two, three more seats up front, so if you want to take a seat now, that would be great. Also, just if you could turn off your cell phones, that would be great also. If you want to do that. It's really great to, uh, to be here with our faculty uh, in this context, to be able to have an opportunity to discuss their works in a more in-depth, kind of intimate way. So I want to thank our artists for agreeing to do this and participating. And I thought we'd dive right in, and I'd like to have the artists each introduce their works in the exhibition briefly, and then I'll continue with some questions, and we'll have a more detailed discussion about the works, and then, at the end, there'll be some time for questions from the audience, so we can really have a full discussion. So, why don't we start with Neil? Thank you, David. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did this thing, and those five things across the wall. Um, <coughs> This is a large painting that, you don't have to, it's okay. Um, this looks really tiny to me right now, I'm sitting. But um, there's a big painting called The Field That Feels Like, and it's uh, The Field? The Field. The Field That Feels Like. That feels like. And um, they were all done kind of separately. You know those uh, puzzles that they're an image and you can move the little grids around to make like a picture of the Incredible Hulk or something like that. They were kind of worked on in that, that kind of, uh, method where they're all done separately and arranged post-production. Post um, and I love Italian painting and they really kind of come out of a rich, like, like working that, you know, bowl of spaghetti kind of, um, dark to light, that kind of loving. And the, 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 the kind of source for them was this uh, conflation of um, one, one year of Prada ads. There were these Prada ads that were really gorgeously decadent, but kind of removed at the same time. And there was like a kind of a Bellini painting that I put up on the, on the wall. So those are my, that was the palette for those. And uh, those are more recent in the back, and there are these uh, small fabric pieces that <clears throat> I thought were kind of like little little passion scenes in a way, like, like passion being the, you know, there's these Fra Angelico frescoes where painted in San Marco and Florence, and there's all these little fragments of, of the passion floating around Jesus' head. So they were kind of done just in that, and you know, that's uh, fabric stretched over a canvas ground. So, um, you know, they're, they're different than this, but the same at the same time. They're more just differently in material than they are ideologically. And I'm done. Great. Stay um, Well, the piece I have here is uh, site-specific. Installation um, was um, made specifically for that space. Uh, I would think I would say that there are two levels in the piece. One which uh, 
relates to the uh, body of work I'm developing related to the idea of museums and uh, certain areas of uh, Latin America, certain cities, certain um, areas That could be called, I don't know if Shanty Town is the right definition, but uh, from here, probably from that stage, everything, everything looks like Shanty Town. Uh, although it refers to a much broader um, uh, reality that uh, includes uh, uh, low income uh, areas of society that are not necessarily defined as Shanty Towns in Latin America. They are, they are like how many, many people live. And, um, and in particular, it's related to, to um, a, society, uh, uh, a problem that in Peru uh, is quite large, uh, uh, which is that we don't have museums of contemporary art. And, um, so I've been working in that field for some time. And while working on that, um, the last years, somehow I found kind of a conflict with the production of objects. I, I, haven't, I have avoided making objects for a long time. I mean, especially, which was hard considering that I was coming from a sculptural background. I mean, before that I was an architect. Then after I went to sculpture, I produced kind of a large number of sculptures for a while. And then I just decided to, to stop doing that. And uh, because I was more interested in conceptual work, or more, more dynamic approaches to, to, to art, and so for me, this is kind of like uh, uh, the first time I had the opportunity to materialize something that I considered at some point was not possible to have a, for, for which was not possible to have expression, a, a material expression. And, um, and also it's a response to the space itself, the space of the gallery. Uh, I thought it was interesting to have a, a gallery with this shape, which is such pronounced, so, so pronounced corners, where when I come here to shows, I normally find that the, the corner is hidden somehow behind a wall. And I wanted uh, to actually show the corner and see how can I actually reuse the corner to say something also about the space, the gallery, and the space outside. So with the piece, I was trying to also uh, break the boundaries of the museum and so show that this piece extends beyond the walls somehow, breaks through the walls. And, um, and the projection that is visible, um, talks about this idea, this ambivalence between this conflict or battle between these kind of cities and the idea of museum, who does the museum serve? So raising several questions about that subject. Because there's a reflection of the Bill Baum Museum. Yes, there is a reflection of the Bill Baum Museum that we can see if it's done from this. But uh, yeah, we, have, we can talk a lot about that more. We love to, but that's basically what I Okay. Um, well, this I, I've forgotten all my other paintings, but there's uh, three other paintings out front, and then birdsong. And I made these four paintings over the course of a year in different locations. And um, my big, the biggest impetus for my work is being in, in different places uh, because they impact my palette and the way that I see, and the kind of overriding artistic tradition that informs my experience of being in a place would be traditional Chinese painting, particularly the Yuan Dynasty period, because within the expanse of a single scroll, you'll have a journey through space from the beginning to the end, which, which when the scroll is un completely unfurled, you have the entire day or pathway happening at once. And that makes sense to me in terms of understanding space because um, I travel a lot, space is almost virtual or fictional, and it sort of offers a way to uh, portray space that makes sense. And the way that I do that in painting, since I have nowhere, I don't have the acumen of the traditional Chinese painter, is to pour out paint and then to follow the pour to its logical conclusion so that the painting is a travelogue, if you will, of a pour, and then I rely on wherever I am to kind of um, saturate the information with the salient characteristics of each place. So this painting right here, Birdsong, was painted in New York. Um, it took up my entire studio for a good three months, and I did it in about six pretty concentrated weeks. <coughs> uh, 
the first four weeks kind of flirting with it, backing off, coming back on for maybe three to six hour sessions, and then a deep, long two week haul where I really lived and breathed the, fine, the defining composition. And the, that's kind of really the short version right there, but I'll tell you that the other paintings, the, the bigger painting out, out in front, the moon, um, it's called Night Moon, and that was the moon in Miami on Saturday night. And that is a Florida moon. Basically, when you're painting in the faculty studios where I do, and then you ride your bike, I live very close, ride my bike home anywhere from 11 to, to, to 4 a.m. I've seen all hours on 131st. It's a very special street. I have a very intimate relationship to it. And, the, and, and so there's a sense that you get, you know, of, of riding through the silky night and the breeze and everything and, and the moon. And that painting has that. And actually, the night I finished that painting, it was a very late night. I rode home in the morning, and I rode right through a, a spider web. So it's kind of like finishing the painting. <laughs> it's a way that I mark space and move from one area to another. It's kind of this webbing. This is kind of a new development. And then the other two paintings are um, uh, The Rocks was painted at Yaddo, which is Saratoga Springs, New York. And that's a, it, uh, it, Yaddo itself is a residency on a pine, and pine a, wo a wooded pine. Yeah. A wooded pine, right? A state. And so you're just so, there's a, a very close feeling with the trees and a very gloomy palette. And then um, the other painting uh, is also painted in New York, Parasol House, started in Florida, finished in New York. And that really reminds me of when I go in Brooklyn, I live on Fulton Street, which is, well, never mind. But um, you go out in, and at night when it's cold, the, the lights all the way up the street sort of glimmer like a little mirage. I mean, you can find it here, you can find it anywhere, street lights. That, that, that is what that painting sort of came to be about. So those are my paintings. Great. <laughs> as you can see, there's hardly any thematic resonance that sort of flows through each individual artist here. So as we proceed, we're going to try to weave a kind of relationship about their studio practice and how they inform what they do and how they arrive at what they do. So we, um, why don't we go back to Neil, we'll start with Neil. Neil once described his work to me as humid, as in humidity. And I thought that was a really, it, it fits the title because you know you invoke this word feel, the feel that feels like. And there's, a, there's, a, there's something about your work that always feels quite figurative or there's a strong relationship to parts of the body. Uh, or entanglements of body, maybe more than one, maybe just one, maybe there's several. Um, so, anyways, if we can tackle that humidity idea and then yeah. this, this figuration. No, I, mean, I think it's a, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of just a, an easy, su seductive thing, but I, you know, I, I still like shiny things. I still like wet things. And, you know, like, I don't, like, I, I'm in Florida, but I, I don't like being outside. Like, I'm Danish and Ukrainian, like we go from white to red, like there's no tan, so the beach, the beach doesn't make sense, so, um, so I, you know, I, I like, you know, the hub, you know, I like dark, dank places, because, you know, I fester well there, so, so this, you know, I, I like, people clean their studio, like, my studio is always kind of just like things piled about, and, you know, junk on the floor, and it's kind of a, a cobbling together of, of, of a lot of things. But, but humid in that, in, yeah, and there's like a thickness. I like, you know, density is good. I mean, I still want there to be, you know, I want them to be accessible, and that, you know, you can, uh, there's no confound thing that about, I mean, they're really just, they're tactile. I mean, and, and in the way that, you know, those are tactile in different ways in that they're, these kind of assemblage things, you know, there's these layers of different <coughs> kinds of non-oil materials. Well, that, that's something I <coughs> wanted to ask you about because um, these are oil, mm -hmm. uh, and you talked about Italian paint, painting, and I know that you studied it in Italy, and yeah, you were quite moved by the painting tradition of the Italians, and um, those are really I like to think about those as really collage, cutout moments of things that you find other places 
bound together by this sticky goo. You know, that, yeah, that really, really, it's like a membrane that is very glossy and sticky and then kind of holds these things in, in a static moment. And you're, in those, it's, it's very appropriate that you, that you take from the actual product catalog or the ad you find in both. But in this case, there's something that seems really key to these works where you, you know, you're actually dragging the whole process through your hand and, and painting these things. And there's no real evidence of these being, well, you said from, from something specific. In fact, they seem invented scenarios. Um, and you can't really draw, I mean, the space is close, it's tight. We don't ever get a full perspective of really what part of the body this is. It's not that explicit, but it's also at the same time a little bit explicit. So, anyways, if you could talk about well, the layering and something like that is a lot more obvious than the layering is in this. I mean, I think the to me the benefit of oil paint is you can really like wipe away a lot, or you can really kind of uh, work things to a place where you know there's a lot of after the kind of construction of, of this thing. Um, there's going back into it and kind of like deciding what to, um, I don't want to say edit out because like whiting out parts weren't, wasn't editing out in a way it was kind of enhancing the, I don't know, the sexuality of the piece or something like that. But, but there I think it's a lot more like, look, there's something over this and I'm going to do a collage thing next to this thing. So it's, it's just a kind of a, I don't know, it's a different way of getting you to want to touch things. I, mean, I really think the the relationship. I, I think these, you know, I think paintings interact. You know, I mean, you, you, know, the, the, you are the the, the, the subject of, of the work. So, um, yeah, I, mean, I think the this. I mean, when I when I paint, there's always a lot of you know. I, I, I tend to be a, a linseed oil medium kind of person, yeah. and you know, I, I I glaze these at the end to give them a little bit of a you know kind of a wet wet feeling, but, um, you know, like those, it's like, you know, how many golden mediums can I get and play around with and do something else to, you know, they're a very different process in that they're a little more selective in a way than, than this is. This is kind of a constant, you know, constant building, but it doesn't, it's, it doesn't read as obviously to me as that does as obvious building. And do you plan these, this type of work out in advance or? No, which makes me tremendously anxious when I'm doing them because, well, there's squares too. So there's, you know, a square divides differently than a rectangle. Mm -hmm. So I kind of knew the whole time that, you know, finding these forms in a square that there would be things that kind of meet up. And there are places where things obviously meet, meet up and are meant to be kind of read as continuous, but then there are these really disjunctive areas. So. So the idea that the field is constantly in the process of, of feeling like something, I mean, that's, the idea is that it's forming the whole time. Right. So and that's part of the idea of it being wet, too. If it was too dry, it wouldn't feel like it was still forming. It would feel you know, dry. Let's return to Neil in a couple minutes, but I want to move on to Cesar. Um, Cesar is an artist that works very differently from Neil at a little bit. In that, and I'd like you to talk about one particular project, which this project seems to be closely related to, which is what you've been working on in Peru. And you just were awarded a creative capital grant, which is a huge honor, so congratulations, to work on that project. And maybe you could talk a little bit more about your project in Peru uh, in relationship to that piece. Right. Uh, the project in Peru uh, is a community-based museum and developing in Puno, which is a town uh, 4,000 meters high, and uh, where the Titicaca Lake uh, is located. Uh, the Titicaca Lake uh, is the highest navigable world, lake in the world. And so we have a large number of tourists coming to this town. And the town itself is a rundown town. Really. Uh, there are no many facilities. Um, it's a second poorest area in Peru. And uh, it's, con it's really a big contrast with uh, wealth of the tourists coming and having so many poor people living, without being able to take any benefit from, from that large uh, number of people able to help them in some ways. So, um, on the other hand, uh, as I said before, in Peru we don't have museums of, museums of contemporary art. 
and, uh, and we have had one project for the last 40 years which is not yet finished. We'll probably never finish it. Um, not only because of financial reasons, but also uh, uh, political reasons and administration. And, and I think there is a, the, the main reason is a, is a, is a principle, mistake in principles. I think that the, the big mistake, uh, not only in terms of museums, but in general, uh, governments in Peru have made is try to copy models from first world countries without having the, the, the resources to take them. And, with, and they haven't actually looked for models that can work within our own reality and our own resources. So what I was trying to find was a model that could um, use our resources and, and create a, a solution for something that was a real problem. And so what I propose, and I'm working on now, is uh, to go to this town, Puno, this town, which is not even the main capital, it's, you know, it's, it's 4,000 meters high. Uh, it's a place where there is no contemporary art. They don't know what contemporary art, and I think that's makes, that makes it more interesting. And, um, and use the, uh, the actual um, condition there that 70% of the houses are unfinished. To go to the neighbors and propose them to let us, for instance, uh, refurnish one room in, in, in their house. A room which, let's say, is, is, inhabit is not inhabited at the moment because in Peru they build over uh, long periods of time. But sometimes to build a house takes several generations. Uh, for instance, they would build the first floor, they live in the first floor, and over the years we would start building the second floor, which will not have a roof for 10 years maybe. And then after 10 years they will build a roof for the second floor, and then we'll start building the third floor. So in the meantime, sons, uh, nephews, granddaughters, everyone moved into the house. And so it ends up being a huge community living in this one house. And uh, so what I'm proposing is, let's say, go to these uh, neighbors and offer them to build or refurnish one room for free with the condition that they would let us exhibit contemporary art for a period of time. So when we have uh, several houses spread in the city, we'll have a museum of contemporary art also spread in the city. So the city itself becomes part of the museum. And the people, the visitors of the museum, will interact. Not only they will see the artworks, but will interact with the owners of the houses. They will bring some financial benefits to them. From those, uh, from that exchange, there will be other opportunities that they will raise. There will be also opportunities for educational workshops and a series of other activities. We will bring artists from not only from Peru, but from abroad. And uh, there is going to be all these. Uh, Parallel study about what is actually the impact art can have in a society like this, uh, which kind of benefits can can be uh, can happen from, from this uh, relationship. So that's what I'm working on. It's a project that's going to take probably ten or more years uh, to fully develop. It's going to develop in several stages. Um, and uh, um, as I was saying before, I mean, since I've been working on this kind of work, which is more conceptual, I have avoided trying to make uh, objects. I mean, I have been participating in shows uh, during this time, but um, normally having works that I have already had or were very, really specific that, um, I mean, uh, work commissions or some sort of uh, work that was really specific, that if I was on my own and I um, was asked Go to the studio. You want to go to the studio and make some work? I would say no. I would rather you not know, go outside and, and do some other kind of work that's it's not object based. It's more uh, interactive, and there's no at the end no result. I would say no material result. So I've been trying. I've been working on that uh, for some time, and um, but recently uh, um, somehow. Uh, I started to change my perception of this, how this could relate, I mean, and how this could have a material expression as well. And um, I'm finding a kind of um, aesthetic element as well in this, because this is a 10 years project. You know? I mean, I, um, it's difficult for me to imagine 10 years without making anything, let's say objects or some sort of expression. I find it difficult. Um, to, 
to be able to spend 10 years without materializing anything. Because um, in my own experience, when you make an object or you make a piece, or, or in this case, this installation, that piece is, is going to raise questions that are going, are going to lead your work, not only this kind of work, but also your other work, the conceptual work, to a world, in our place. So, to me, always, whenever, whatever my stage in my career was, whether I was as an architect or when I was making, because I spent years making uh, abstract sculpture as well, I had always worked with opposites. I had always worked, if I was working with something very abstract, I was working at the same time with something very geometrical, and, and, I'm sorry, figurative. So I was always trying to make a, uh, somehow uh, things that contradicted themselves. And from that contradiction, I found always third element. That's what brought me something new to think about or to play with or to develop. But we, these works, they seem very much like models or prototypes for a kind of approximation or an analogy to the project that you're actually working on. Because this architecture, is it based on the architecture in Peru that you sort of Yes, it is. Uh, it is Peru, but not only Peru can be um, generalized. Yeah, it is a very simplified um, version of what these kind of towns are, not right. only in Peru, but Latin America, not only Latin America, but maybe also in other continents. But you you could also work in a documentary style where you might take photographs that are kind of remains of what you might do out in the world and then install them into the gallery as well, too. So you mean like. Um, I don't the get. photo installation, I've seen photos of before. This is another work. You, you've done that before. You just, when you work out in the field, you, you, you document that. Yeah, that I've done, yeah, I've done, yeah. And you, you install that documentation yeah. as a work in, a, in an exhibition space. Yeah. So that's how you, that's one of the ways that you sort of find a way to bridge the gap between what you do out in the world, which can be quite messy. Yeah. And quite human. Yeah. And filled with a lot of negotiation with this kind of moment here where it's, it's one shot. Yeah, the difference I would say between you know, that kind of approach you mentioned just now, like photographs and documentation and the, Yeah. And this one is that um, uh, there is absolutely no object or no um, um, <coughs> materialization actually, but just documentation. And right. what I do is uh, I do the job of an architect. I organize that information right. spatially. Uh, well, here, there's also that. Yes. But this piece, in a way, because of the relationship between the, the, the material aspect of it and, and this other element which I'm exploring, the use of these photographs, and, mm -hmm. uh, I can see it developing in its own way as, a, as an object, let's say. Right. And I'm proud to this piece and developing another piece, which is um, uh, also a photograph, but uh, which is also. Uh, it's actually the photograph of uh, the Guggenheim Museum as well, but made out of a sort of downscale model, made out of these tiny bricks, mm -hmm. which is not going to be itself the object, but it's just going to be the photo of that object, okay, which is going to right. be fine. Well, but yeah, it's kind of the work that still starts developing on its own uh, as a separate body of work mm -hmm. to the one that we're developing in the group. This may take over the action. Okay. I've got one more question for you. This is a good lead into Elizabeth as well, which is that Cesar, you uh, live in you're, you're a trained architect, mm -hmm. and you studied the studio arts. You lived in Japan for seven years, and you lived, you of course lived in Peru, mm -hmm. lived in Japan, lived in London, and then now you're here. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you can sort of reflect on. What it's like being an artist here. Well, you're also in New York. Yeah. So you've been up, up a few places, but I just want you to reflect briefly on what it's like being here since since you're new to Tampa and, mm -hmm. and how your practice might be shifting given that you're here now. Right. Yeah. Um, I've been to Tampa many times before, I have to say, because I have family here. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I didn't imagine that I was going to you know, find this job here. It's wonderful. I mean, it's I, one thing I always tell my students and, and, and friends here is that I'm so impressed to see how many important artists you meet here at USF. 
having, living, having lived in New York and London and Tokyo for so many years, you don't run into those people. You know? So I think you meet, have more chances to meet those people in Tampa than living in New York. <laughs> I feel that way, you know, like since I've been in USF at least. I've, been, I've seen so many, so many uh, important artists here that I wouldn't have met in other places. Yeah. But um, yeah, I think that I, I've been so busy since I arrived here that I haven't had a chance to really feel a difference. What is the difference between Tampa and New York? <laughs> I feel still that this is like New York. You know, I don't know if it's not letting me know, please, because probably <laughs> I'm exaggerating. Well, that's a good plug. Right? <laughs> but but uh, I haven't really, I mean, I drive my house and then come to school, go back to my house. And I say I was in New York. The only difference is that here I drive. Here I take the subway. I would say that's a difference. Right. And I have a great student here, my student here was uh, right. so I think that's the difference here yeah, basically. But um, <laughs> exposure I think is, uh, is, is great that you have access here to it and it's amazing I think. And people I, who were some of my best friends in New York, I found out actually they were, they were students from here. So the small, the world at the end was smaller, like Tron Louis, you know, Tron, Tron Louis, yeah. he was a good friend of mine from New York and ended up being, being a student from here. Great. So, no, it's like, it's not so uh, different. Right. Okay. Well, Elizabeth. Elizabeth yes. was away painting in New York, and when she arrived into the museum, she was talking about the realities of being back in Tampa and teaching it. And, and um, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> the reason why I bring that up is because there's uh, something about your practice and your process which is intense and it seems like it, it's about as you mentioned already it's about place and it's about if it's about place it's about time and um, and it's about a kind of transference of things that I think that you bring into it and um, I wonder if you could just elaborate on what you already began talking about and just talk about place a little bit more specifically to the way that you work and time to the way that you work and and how you work and how you balance your life here and there. Okay, so you want life, not process of work. Or, I'm just going to wind it up. I'm going to wind it around. Please wind it all okay. the way Okay, I, I, I grew up in L.A. and I left L.A. when I was about 26. And I went to Chicago, I went to New York for a summer and then I went to back to L.A. for a brief funky period. And then I went to Chicago for grad school. Five years in Chicago, ten years in New York. Came upstate New York and Manhattan and Brooklyn. And came to um, flo came to Tampa from there, um, and t so it was kind of going back to LA. The landscape I hadn't seen a landscape like this or light like this since LA. You know, Bougainvillea doesn't grow in, in Manhattan in the same way that it grows here, or palm trees. So or in LA. So that really so right away time, and that's where the Chinese painting came in. Time just kind of collapsed, and that's the way I like it. And in, in fact, what attracted to me, me to New York, I'm going to skip a little bit, but just go with me, because this is I'm talking about time, and this is the way I do it. But when I got to New York, the subway system was really intoxicating, because like at West 4th Street, you can go you know, two floors down, and you can catch trains going everywhere. It's like you can go anywhere in the city from West 4th Street. And so I really love that kind of, like a, like a Rolodex type of space, you know, like a really compressed and layered experience of time. So the landscape of Florida provided that with LA, and then and then Chinese painting as an overlay is a formal way to maybe talk about inventing a new language to portray this experience of landscape. Um, and then also the simultaneous time of the scroll. Um, and then also the compression that you find, let's say, at the West 4th Street subway stop, that you can just sort of have these layers of that. Which everyone knows. Right? Well, you know, but I mean, really, you can go. Like, if you go there and you go to West 4th Street, you know what I'm saying. So, um, and, 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 and I actually don't experience that in Tampa because it's kind of, um, you know, flat. So you're always taking surface road. So that underground thing is important <coughs> for that metaphor, um, as are computers, but I digress, kind of. So, so that's one way in which time, or several ways in which time sort of collapses and bends. And it does anyway, doesn't it? I mean, we're never really in just one place at one time. And painting is kind of always summoning that sense of simultaneity in one way or another. Especially in your work. 
deals like? Yeah, I, I, you know, that's hard for me to say because I, I, can't, I don't know what other people experience when they paint. But yeah, I mean, certainly it takes time to make a painting. And in that time, it's, I mean, I used to think painting was like acting. Like, like to get in, if you have a few paintings going at once, each one has a particular ethos. And so you kind of have to gear up to get back into that ethos that's informing the painting. You know, it's not like you can just say, oh, I'm going to paint today, I'm going to do that, because it's not mechanical. You know, it's like a whole, it's a whole endeavor that involves every, every fiber of your being, your memory, all of it, you know, and, and, and your technical, all of it. So, so in that sense, um, in that sense, time always collapses in any, in, in any painting session on any work. Um, That's good. Yeah, right. Well, <laughs> it's interesting because when I look at this painting, I see multiple kind of windows into space. I mean, they're, they're not framed. Uh, traditionally, they might be framed by how you start the painting, which is by a big pour, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. And that, that's something I think is quite interesting about your work, is that if you look at the four canvases that are in the show, each one is very different. The architecture of the painting is very different. Uh, the palette of the painting is very different. And the end result of the painting and its compositional kind of total equation is very different. And part of that that I would like you to talk about is that that is very much intrinsic to the way that you work. You start with something that is uncontrolled. It's a gesture that's uncontrolled, which then kind of leads you into these multiple little crevices or cracks or open spaces in the painting that you build upon and it takes some time to do that. But within them, there are these small little windows into space. Some of them are seed back into space. Some of them are really right out front. Some of them are, uh, the scales aren't, um, in line with each other, they're not approximate. So there's very much this feeling of um, kind of collapsing of time and space and place. So if you could talk about how you actually do that and, and maybe walk people through this painting, I think that'd be quite interesting. Oh, I have to stand up for that. Um, uh, the painting started with the huge pour, this green, which is pretty gross, you know. Um, uh, like all the way through, and um, and I put something. This is an acrylic painting. I work with acrylic oil in combination with acrylic, and um, but in this case, it's all acrylic. And um, I put extender and retarder in it to keep the paint open. And what that does is, it's a very, it's like a 24-hour drying time, but then the paint can start to coagulate and do weird things. And that's the starting point. And then I get to edit, and that's really fun. So I'll I'll paint half of the painting out. Um, and that's, that's the case in this one. There was a lot more green on it before. So um, it's funny, I'm almost not, uh, I started coming off the left-hand side and working the top, and I didn't have no idea what I was doing. And, um, and so I was going really small. And I have to say, I would probably spend a week in this area right here, and that with a script brush, which is like a, it's tiny. And um, so, you know, like there's a lot of dithering that happens to warm up. And then the structure started to make itself felt through the tree, and then mountain forms, and so forth. I mean, I'm being quite literal. No, but the, the pulling across of the paint, the blue and the green working together, the kind of mountainous tree-like forms, it doesn't even matter what they are, the black forms at the top, um, started to suggest a kind of um, distant horizon. And then I could sort of topple it down towards the front. But this was happening very inchoately. I wasn't saying that. I was looking at it going, what is, you know, what is that, what is it, like, what, like okay, it's like a, a pine forest at night, but I'm, that's, I'm, that's not available to me. What, you know, so it was like something distant, that's what was established. And then <laughs> things started to grow. The, the, the tree trunks were mountains, but they had flat tops, and they ended up being tree trunks. And, and then I started editing out a lot with, um, like, with, with sky blue and light blues, too. Um, sort of bring, to, to make more ambiguous the figure ground situation so that not, so that even while there were concrete objects in the painting that are recognizable as tree forms, you would not be constricted to a kind of space where they were uh, grounded, literally. And uh, finally, one last thing. A baby, there, I, because I was in Brooklyn, the you know, sound in, in the loft was really bad. There was a baby born, um, and the baby was, had its first six weeks while I was making this painting. So, so um, I would listen to Baby Cry and make this painting and feel total tension. And, um, and then a little bird form came up at the end and I saw it. And I didn't realize it was the baby until later, but I kind of thought maybe there was a relationship. 
But I mean, that's very yeah, literal, that's and it, just, it doesn't happen in that kind of naming way. It just, you know, like there were some drips that looked like a bird, and suddenly I put a beak on it. And it was, you know, like that's a big deal. Like some people go out and drink. I put a beak on the drip, you know? That's how you work, and I think it's a really important thought about that. And just staying on that theme of what informs and how you work and work, and, and this question will lead back into Neil, but this is for you first, Elizabeth. Is, <clears throat> since I've known you, uh, there's been a lot of specific knowledge that has informed your process. Uh, I know that palettes have moved, traditional palettes have moved in and out of your work. Um, and you mentioned Chinese painting, and you mentioned a certain dynasty, and you mentioned, I, I know that you've traveled to China somewhat, and you practice that quite traditionally, and that is a specific body of knowledge that's kind of informed your work. But just over the years, and even in a previous body of work, that you did, there's always been, um, which was figurative, uh, there's always been, I think, specific bodies of knowledge that already exist that kind of traverse through your work and spark some new discoveries and movement towards things. So I wonder if you could talk about like how you draw things in, how you digest them, and then when you let them go. Hmm. Well, I plead guilty to modernist education where one advances the tradition with innovation. And um, I'm extremely attracted to figure painting, but never felt that I could do it. I gave up, I guess. Um, what was funny was when I was making figurative work, which you can't see, so I won't spend a long time on it. Um, I was painting dolls as figures, and um, I started to pile them up, and they became landscapes. So it was kind of like, okay, I get it. <coughs> And, um, and I, I think for a long time I aimed it at tradition as something to master, you know, like a 10-year-old kid thinks that mimesis is, is good art, you know, like if you can replicate it, it really is good, that's quality, like how close can you copy? And I think I had that relationship for a long time to my crush on figure painting, and I think that was the fatal flaw, you know, because I couldn't own it in any kind of personal way. Um, and Chinese painting was very liberating because um, in the ancient dynasties, there are several people in this audience who would know precisely which one, but I'm going to say probably the 6th century. There was a credo written on the six principles of great painting, and the first one is that the painting have qi, energy, a sense of energy, and qi is all-encompassing. Um, it's a spiritual and a technical force. It's a life within the painting. And if that, and that is like, that's just fabulous, you know? It just kind of, kind of takes the pressure off. It's like, I know how to feel a painting. So I, I kind of, it, it was very liberating. And then to study the idioms with Mr. Ho in Taichung, Taiwan, I could never translate his name for you. He didn't speak a lick of English, nor I of Mandarin. Um, we, he taught me the four gentlemen, bamboo, orchid, um, uh, Chrysanthemum and plum blossom, and they all have different meanings, like bamboo is resilience, plum blossom is hardiness because it grows in the snow, um, things like that. And orchid is both shy and very um, elegant, so there's a kind of modesty to this uh, symbol. And these, are, and these are marks with ink, so if you know calligraphy, you can just make them very directly, and you can animate them with your body memory and your chi, and you, and you get a painting out of these recombination and recombination of symbols. And the combination and recombination really struck me as sexy because then you could have a limitation, but you could just constantly reshuffle. So that kind of, that, I mean, all those things together in some kind of stew that happens in the studio really inform my painting now. But that combination also keeps growing because I didn't, because I don't, because I'm not a calligrapher too, it goes back to that 10 year old mimesis thing. I can't just say, I get, you know, like, I can't just take the calligraphy. I just can't, I'm just not, you know what I mean? So, so I have to riff on it in my own way. I hope that answers your question. No, that does. That's mm -hmm. great. Well, let's ask the same question of Neil, because I've often walked into Neil's studio and I felt like it, <clears throat> I was, I don't know, brought back a few hundred years into the way that you approach oil painting seems incredibly traditional. And um, it seems like a very studied and academic approach. Yet you're able to make that work, which is really not. And there's, it's a kind of interesting balance that you play with. Yeah, I just, I'm really impatient, and it, it's you know, it can be a fault. But um, 
I, I, I think, you know, I still look at those images, like, especially the Renaissance images, and I think they're weirder and more bizarre than the things we do now. Right? I just like everything. You know. yeah. um, so, like, that kind of, like, I always want that kind of, like, opulence or something. Like, you know, I think those, like, despite their their subject matter or whatever, the one, like, you look at them physically, like, that kind of palpability is, is incredible, or that, that the situation you're you're put in when you're looking at those paintings is amazing. Like, Baroque churches, it, it isn't just, you know, it isn't just the Caravaggio painting, it's the marble inlay, it's the this, and the, you know, your, your head is spinning the whole time. Mm -hmm. So, so, I mean, I think my appreciation of, of oil painting came from that. I, I, you know, it's like weird, like, I think you always pervert your background in some way, but, like, I don't think I was, like, really classically trained or anything, but I think that's just how it happened. Like, there's a combination of things that happened that made me really think of oil painting that way. Like, my biggest guilty pleasure is Mary Highland right now. Like, I saw the show and I'm like, but it's because I can't do that. Maybe it's, like, the figure painting thing. It's like, I can't do that. I have no, like, I would love to do Mary Highland's paintings and be as, like, be as bad as I could be, but right. it's just not going to happen, so it's fine. Um, so, I mean, I, I, you know, I think it's just a different way of finding kind of a, a physical approach. Like, I, I enjoy the plasticity of things, and I, I don't think that's a, a, a more or less sincere relationship. It's just a different relationship. You know, and I think, you know, these things pour out of, like, just looking at, at all the schlock, you know. I mean, and I don't even mean that in a bad way. I think the schlock and real forms, like, you know, just pop, pop culture stuff or whatever. Um, so I like, you know, I like that kind of building up of those where, like, the fabric's all from Joanne's, so, like, going shopping is really important to those, because, like, you know, I want to pick the fabric swatches that are really, you know, I try to be open, but I'm like, wow, that fabric swatch would be really great to do some weird perverted stuff on top of it. Right. You know, to pervert that pattern, or to pervert something that we think of as, like, you know, a nice decorative thing in the home, you know. The way, like, you know, I look at a Gucci and I'm like, this is really perverse. It's the Virgin Mary baby. But I'm like, this is really perverse. The way the hand just kind of stiffly wraps around the baby's body. Like, this is fascinating to them when they're figuring out perspective of the body. So, I, you know, like, I like all that. You know, I, I love the Italian tradition because I, when I go to Italy, I like to eat, like, two hour lunches and drink a bunch of wine and eat steak because it's a better kind of approach to life. <laughs> To me, so I mean that's that informs the paintings as much as like liking Caravaggio or something. You know, there's something about Renaissance painting that's really missing from your work, which is perspective. Yeah, I the work in a kind of way. You do. Yeah, no, I mean I just I, I you know I really like this orientation. Like I don't kind of like to know where I am too much. Yeah. You know, I mean I like even in well, I was doing these installation things at Skaheen and William Popel was like, you should see video journal because I had never seen it as this Cronenberg movie where you kind of like, you never know what's, and even in the new um, Charlie Kaufman movie, the Synecdoche, you never know that barrier between, you know, what you're making and what you're, what you're experiencing, you know, because this thing isn't real and what you're experiencing is real. So, um, so, so that kind of, I have no idea why I'm not. But, but that, yeah, that kind of um, non-perspective is, is important. And, you know, those things happen really weirdly back there. Cause it's like, you know, you're just trying to, you're poking, I'm poking around. I'm poking around on this too, but, it, you know, it becomes a more kind of maybe, maybe a seamless hole, even though it's these, these panels. But. It's interesting to think about painting as a synecdoche. Yeah, well, because, uh, you know, this thing could go on, you know, forever. I mean, there's no... It, it was rearranged before it became this too. So, you know, in that way, maybe it's a fault to mine that this could never come to an end. I can mean, make 75 million more three foot by three foot squares that I could figure a way to make this stuff. But as long as, like, I just saw today there's this uh, UCSD women's study student who's like auctioning off her virginity. And it's at $3.75 million right now, by the way, in case you wanted to know. <laughs> but uh, if there's stories like that that are popping up all the time, like, I don't think there's an end to, to the kind of content I'm interested in. So in a way, I like that this can keep going. Okay, we're going to leave it there. We're going <laughs> to open up to questions.
because that's a great way to end. So, does anybody have any questions for our artists? <laughs> And the abundance of that kind of resource, um, which is uh, readily available, and maybe that environment that the installation is created of. Uh, uh, mm, yeah, I mean, this could probably have made, been made in our materials as well. Um, the, the, the reference was having different, I mean, in this case, they probably make a closer reference to what you see in Peru, where houses are made out of clay, and, or they are made out of bricks. Uh, and and um, at some point that was, I mean, uh, this has been like a uh, uh, work that has taken to the very last minute to make, we have been taking decisions to the very last minute. And um, I can some of the things, it. sorry. I can attest to that. Yeah. And that's unfortunately the way I work normally. I mean, Sometimes I stretch it more than others. Unfortunately, this kind of work is site-specific work. I mean, I, there's no way I can make a piece and bring it right to, to the gallery. So, so there were uh, um, many decisions that were taken here in the gallery, but um, the material itself uh, had, um, I think, an, an appeal. I have, an, uh, I have worked with clay many, many years. Uh, before doing anything else, I started with clay. I was making ceramics. That's the first thing I worked with. And what I found exciting about this piece was to be able to meet again this material and do something with it. That was not what I was doing when I just started. And um, and I'm happy living in Bro because I mean I was just making an art piece for an art show, which, uh, I, for which I fired pieces, but. In that case, it was because the pieces were going far away, and they always would have broken. But I like the peel of the clay also raw because of the, the fragility it has, and uh, the fact actually many works broke while we were installing them, and that was part of somehow the process. But I think that the material maybe has that that uh, extra value that, for instance, I could have made it also probably could have made it out of wood. Maybe. If I found the right, uh, if I wanted to represent the set Tampa or houses where you know, people build their houses with wood, I would uh, have maybe chosen that. But, but in this case, clay has that appeal to what happens in Peru, <coughs> has also the addition that is a very fragile material that um, I think helps. You feel it's very fragile, and you cannot even breathe, breathe very strongly on your face because you feel it's going to break. I think somehow that's how I feel in Latin America. Things could fall down, fall apart. Somehow. I think that that kind of the material kind of helped me to to add something else to, to the piece in that level. Great, Gregory. Um, this is uh, this this is sort of some comments, um, and uh, uh, if you guys just sort of respond to some of it, and hopefully I don't. I'm, off with some of this. Um, it's, it's been really interesting listening to you talk. Because um, I'm, I'm listening to real artists talk. And um, yeah, I'm listening to real artists talk. Um, <laughs> I'm listening to real artists talk. Um, and um, you know, I've only been teaching now for two and a half years, and this is a new thing for me. Um, and uh, listening to particularly Neil and Elizabeth talk about their work, the development of the work, and how they work. It's sort of the antithesis of the sort of educational construct that we utilize. <laughs> um, and I'd love for you guys to sort of reflect upon that. And thank you very much for basically saying, 
that you don't necessarily know what this is going to be when you start. Um, and, and that's the reality of a lot of things. Um, and then also, um, when I was a student, um, there was a lot of uh, emerging arts organizations, a lot of things developing, um, and uh, museums, contemporary museums and traditional museums, um, were basically seen by many people as mausoleums, um, places uh, for art to go to die. Mm -hmm. um, and Cesar, uh, you're talking about, you know, sort of the new model of what a museum or an art space can be. Um, and I think some of the most exciting things that have been happening um, in the art world has been coming out of this. And this Creative Capital Project is, uh, I, I sell what you want, this sounds wonderful. Um, I, I'm, I'm jealous. <laughs> I'm jealous. <laughs> but, but, but um, um, uh, one, 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 I don't know if you know about Mamco, uh, which was started in Geneva by Christian Bernard, um, I think in 9394. Chambers in Pardon? Well, I mean, yeah, maybe I'm like the same. Yeah, um, but uh, this was a contemporary museum that was started that was really the museum itself was a place of experimentation. Um, and the museum was sort of the work of art. Uh, Christian, you know, did things himself in terms of how to uh, rework it, but he also would like bring in an artist and the museum would be theirs to do whatever for four to six months, or um, before the museum would suddenly be somebody's studio. At one point, um, there was a, uh, a cyber techno anarchist squad in a major building in Geneva that actually um, did a partnership where um, the, the museum and these squatters sort of came together, um, switched places, and did all sorts of things. But it's something I'm going to just interrupt because um, and just say, let's just answer one part of that because there are three totally different statements. One was huge, the first one, and I don't think we want to get into a pedagogical argument or discussion right now. So let's stick to the artists and maybe we can just talk about that last part, which is the museum as this place where there's a kind of alternative. And, and, and then from there depart and see where we, we could get to. But um, I'm not, I'm not, um, um, Pretend I'm creating a completely new thing. I mean, I know that this is on the table already for some time. I know museums have been challenged, the conception of museums have been challenged already for a while. And several things have been done already. Um, and I found people, when I told them about my idea, oh, that sounds like this project which happened in Cuba, or this which happened in, 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 in France, or this has happened in uh, uh, Documenta. So uh, I'm aware of those things. Although the, the project I'm developing is particular to specific reality, which is this town, or this situation we have in Peru. And from there, we might be able to apply it to other towns. I mean, the, what's interesting, I think, about um, my experience in particular, is that no one has done it in Peru yet. I mean, and no one has actually seen the potential. There's a potential there to do it. And so I'm trying to, to, to use that that potential uh, and see what comes out. And we established a dialogue with like uh, when Rick Lowe's got here, uh, we had a chance when they brought him to see uh, we had a chance to talk about uh, talking about the project and he was interested to talk. I mean for me it's as interesting to develop the project as to establish those connections with other people who are working in the same area and, and see how can we build an alternative system. Well that's probably the pretentious but but still Establish those links that kind of make us not feel don't feel we are alone. We are we are a network of people doing similar things in different places, and it's part of a response to the saturation in the system. I think uh, which happens everywhere. So, so I think that that is <coughs> part of the project as well. It's, it's, I don't think that it's, uh, I'm not alone. It's, I'm, I'm not the first one. Maybe Elizabeth and Neil can respond. Just sort of. A I'm actually still really on the grad school question. Well, <laughs> but, uh, uh, you go ahead again. This is really the last question, so we're going to end it right after this. So, so what? <laughs> to validate payment? Well, <laughs> you can choose the or not. <laughs> I mean, I don't see any reason why I need to. There's an answer. There's an answer. I, I like the idea that 
museums aren't places of archives to die. Or, I mean, that, the, the idea that um, historical modes of looking at things don't, aren't dated. I mean, I think they get, they get refreshed and new. And, um, you know, we need new generations of decorators for the rich, so. <laughs> That's another answer. <laughs> Let's continue this discussion. You're welcome to come up and talk to the artist directly. And thank you very much for coming. It's been a lot of fun.